Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening to celebrate 30 years of raising funds to help Friends of Rosie. <clears throat> My name's Felicity Goody. I'm the chairman of Friends of Rosie, and I'm sharing a camera with uh, Professor Caroline Dive, who you'll hear from in just a moment. But first of all, can I say um, a very quick housekeeping note? Um, we didn't want to spend money on expensive technical assistance. The presentations I know are going to be absolutely first class, but you might find that some of the transitions between presentations um, are a, a wee bit punky. So I do hope that you'll bear with us. We're doing this uh, in the aid of, uh, uh, in aid of uh, making sure that we don't waste any money on unnecessary technical assistance. I hope by the end of the day, we don't rue that saving <laughs> anyway. Um, welcome to you again. And as most of you uh, already know, Rosie was a little girl who lived in Altrincham, and that's in the northwest of England. She was diagnosed with a childhood cancer. The doctors and the scientists uh, told her distraught parents that although they would try everything possible to save her, there were very few cures, very few treatments, and no preventative means to combat a disease which, frankly, in adults, is um, now often containable and even curable. Rosie died at the age of just five. That was more than 30 years ago. And since then, billions of pounds have been poured into research into adult cancers. And of course, there have been some spectacular results. But childhood cancers, the research for that, unfortunately, is still woefully short. The doctors and the scientists who treated Rosie told her parents that what was desperately needed was new research and new ways of thinking about the research. In particular, therefore, what they wanted was a pump priming fund to launch new ideas. Rosie's parents listened and they set up our charity, Friends of Rosie. From the start, they were absolutely inundated with offers of help, not just from their extended family, but by total strangers. Everybody wanted to do something. And so Lisa and Patrick Larkin were absolutely determined right from the beginning that every penny should be spent on research if that was at all possible. In other words, that overhead should be kept to a bare minimum. So we have no expensive offices. We have no highly paid executives. Indeed, until quite recently, we didn't have any paid staff at all. Everything was done by volunteers. Now, happily, in recent years, we enjoy the help, in fact, more than help, of one incredible part-time paid member of staff. But it's you, the thousands of volunteers and supporters who have actually raised the millions of pounds, which over the last 30 years have gone into pump priming new ideas, which might lead to potential treatments, prevention, and one day even cures. Our focus lately has been very much on trying to find kinder treatments, because as you will hear in a moment, some of the side effects of the present treatments for ch children with childhood cancer are truly horrific. We don't decide what to fund. We have an incredibly distinguished International Scientific Advisory Board uh, of experts. And tonight you will hear from their chairman, Professor John Hickman. And <clears throat> you will also meet two of our top research scientists, uh, who are leading uh, some of our current projects. And you'll hear also from three young people, each one of whom has survived a childhood cancer, but often at a terrible cost. But first, let's hear from Rosie's mum, Lisa Larkin, as she reflects on 30 years of raising money to fund research, to find kinder treatments and potential cures. She was in Technicolor, really. And from the moment she was born, she had an animation and the love of life about her that was extraordinary. And everybody remarked about, about Rosie. She wasn't going to be called Rosie, but when she was born, she just seemed to be Rosie. It was almost as if she was packing in a lifetime into a short few years. that Rosie had and that she would die. But nobody asked me any questions and nobody could answer any questions. It was 
a blankness. And I thought I could not believe that, that there were cancers that were totally incurable from day one. And it was a ch children's cancer. And I decided that we needed to set up some sort of fund to try and rectify the situation, to concentrate on all childhood cancers, not just the one that my daughter uh, had. So we set out to change it, and I think we have. I think just being here after 30 years is a proud moment, uh, shared by us all. It's not easy to, uh, to do research into childhood cancer. Uh, you don't see instant results. And our niche role of pump priming, which is to give startup funding in new ideas, is the long haul. It's the very beginning, it's the most important part. Over the last 30 years, I've met some remarkable and wonderful people who gave their time, their energy, their skills, and their generosity to make all this possible. And without them, we wouldn't be able to uh, say the progress that we've all achieved together. In recent years, we've been supported by uh, our young ambassadors who've done an absolutely marvelous job, uh, Ruth Grace and Daniel. My name is Daniel Richardson, or Dan. Um, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 1989 when I was three years old. I want to kind of give hope, really. I think that's the main reason, kind of this idea that, you know, I can be someone um, who's led a healthy life, having had um, leukemia as a child, um, and perhaps I can give hope um, to families and children that you know, are struggling through it at this time. Um, I also know quite a bit about, just from the research that I know that Friends of Rosie has done, um, about the harshness of the treatments. And I know that that's something that Friends of Rosie have been working hard towards, and that's something that resonates with me. A few reasons really um, why I choose Friends of Rosie and why I am continuing to choose Friends of Rosie. Um, the link between myself and Rosie is a nice one, um, a poignant one. We were both on the ward at the same time, a similar age, I think. Um, I think my mum remembers kind of her being around at that, that time that I was too. Um, also the Manchester link that, you know, they're a Manchester based charity and um, I'm from Manchester originally, even though I live in Oman in the Middle East right now. Uh, also, the fact that it's a small charity, and I know that every little penny raised is is going to um, fund childhood cancer research, um, and that you you know that they need the money more than the bigger charities, and also that they um, they spend every penny that they do get in from donations on childhood cancer research. So, in short, they're the best. Hi, my name is Jill and I'm Daniel's mum. Um, we're back in December 1989 when Dan was on here. A little boy just turned three. He was diagnosed with leukaemia. Quite by accident, it was down to the um, doctor that we had at the time spotting. He um, had very early symptoms by Friday afternoon, he got ALL. He was admitted onto the ward and I remember a lady saying to me, um, what's he got? And I said, he's got ALL, a, a term I'd never heard in my life before. And she said, that's a good leukemia. And I remember sitting there thinking, how can it be a good leukemia? She said, it's treatable. And it was treatable. And Daniel came through his treatment through the help and support of Pendlebury under the amazing Pat Morris Jones, his consultant. And we, um, as a family, remained positive. 
In terms of, of research, I think the reason Daniel did survive is because of the research that had, had gone on. Um, because earlier years, um, I believe it wouldn't it wouldn't have been detected so early, and he probably wouldn't have been able to get the the fantastic treatment that he did. Um, and I think in terms of what I would like to see going forward, is better research, more money put into research. So these children, um, like Daniel, can carry on and and are able to to live a normal, healthy life. Well, research is indeed the key, not only to finding cures for childhood cancers, but as we've heard in developing kinder and more effective treatments. I am John Hickman. Uh, I'm a research scientist and I chair the Scientific Advisory Board, which recommends which projects Friends of Rosie should fund, the priorities. Friends of Rosie specializes in what's called pump priming. I see this as a sort of scientific nursery. And uh, I'm going to introduce to you the, the gardeners who look after this nursery and make sure that the projects come through and flower. So pump priming is to really help the most early and most promising research ideas on which future treatments and maybe even cures uh, depend. So how does Friends of Rosie assure that only top class projects are funded and they actually deliver? Next slide, please. I'm doing a Chris Whitty here. Well, it's because we actually use experts in a group called the Scientific Advisory Board. And what it does, it sets the priorities for research and treatment of childhood cancers. Um, they and I discuss where the money might best be spent, where it might have the greatest impact. And then we ask for applications and we need to find international experts to review these applications uh, for the money coming from FOR to make sure that it really is uh, a high quality project. And what the Scientific Advisory Board does is to make final recommendations to the trustees on what should be funded and what should not be funded as well. Next, please. So these are the people that are on it. Uh, I'm actually, I live in Paris now. And if you look at the rest of the experts that are there, they're all involved in pediatric cancer. Uh, they're spread out throughout the UK. And in some ways, this, I think, prevents any sort of um, conflict of interest within Manchester. So these are in independent reviewers. Next, please. So how, how does it work? Next. Well, when there's, there are sufficient funds uh, in Friends of Rosie, uh, as you know, there are call, calls for proposals and we ask scientists in the Northwest and sometimes from outside people uh, see the stuff on the, on the website, of course. Um, and we ask that they send in a proposal uh, for research in the areas of priority mainly that we've defined. Next. A pile of um, proposals arrive. Uh, they're made up of this form that you can see, a Friends of Rosie form, which is, uh, giving all the details of what the research is about, what it should deliver, and of course, its costs. The proposals arrive, and the Scientific Advisory Board then decides on three international reviewers, experts for each project, asking them for their opinion. And we go, next slide, um, well, next picture, and we go all over the world to, to find these experts, wherever they are, uh, we ask them to review these projects, uh, and I write an awful lot of emails to these people asking again for their unpaid help in, in reviewing uh, these proposals. Next, please. So the international experts read and grade the proposals. And at the bottom here, you can see 
they come out as either being outstanding, or number five, to unfundable at zero. And we do, get, we do get some outstanding ones, as you know, and we also get some unfundable ones, and sometimes some very excellent ones, which we don't really have enough money for. And the reviewer gets this form that you can see here on the right, asking how valid, sound, and appropriate is the plan of investigation? And does it satisfy the criteria of being pump priming? Is this the project at the nursery stage? Comment on whether the proposal is going to give value for money. Could it be planned in a way that would perhaps reduce the costs by just doing part of it to begin with? And are the benefits for treatment and diagnosis for cancer absolutely realistic? And we ask whether or not they know of other people doing the same thing so that we don't have too much overlap. But sometimes if we do find people doing the other things, then we put them in contact. And then these projects are scored, as I've said. Next, please. So the, the reports come back. Um, so there's three reports for each project. The Scientific Advisory Board, who I introduced to you, reads all the comments. Uh, we have a big discussion about whether we think the comments are appropriate. Usually they are. And then uh, we choose what we think are the most appropriate projects to fund. And we send our recommendations to the Friends of Rosie Trust with, with our decision. And uh, we justify that decision. Next, please. Well, the projects get funded and get started. But we don't stop there because we actually ask for reports on progress. And we very much hope that the work that's being done will result in publications. And we're reviewing, as you can see in the picture of us, again, discussing these. Uh, we're reviewing the quality of the project and giving feedback uh, to the scientists that are performing it. And we very much hope that this nursery stage, the pump priming stage, will lead to successful applications for national or international funding uh, of a really uh, a very much greater uh, amount of uh, funding, um, perhaps as, as for as long as five years. And ultimately, of course, uh, what we want to see is an application in the clinic, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, in a moment or two. Next slide, please. So the Scientific Advisory Board, what does it do? Very simply, it makes sure that your contributions are spent very carefully. And we really spend a lot of work with um, experts making sure that this is the case. But without funding to get uh, good ideas, really very good ideas off the ground, there can't be any progress in how children with cancer will be treated now and in the future. In some cancers, there's still no cure. And as you've heard before from Daniel, um, the treatments are harsh and sometimes with long-term, rather unpleasant side effects. Ruth Grace is a Friends of Rosie Young ambassador, and she wanted to share her experiences firsthand with you. I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in my left lower leg when I was eight years old. I had MAP chemo, which meant I was in, caught in the hospital for weeks on end. And when I got a temperature, even on the days I was at home, I had to go back in, which meant I was missing a lot of school and I couldn't see any of my friends. I, I helped make the decision to have the amputation because of the amount of time I was having in hospital, I thought having the amputation could make me stop having all the treatments and so I could be able to do more stuff like going out with my friends, going back to school. The prosthetic leg took a few months to get used to because I've got a knee joint that decides to just bend when it wants and 
I, I, that meant I was falling over quite a bit at the beginning and now I can do quite a bit on it. I can go out with my sister. I can also go out on my scooter and that means I've got more freedom to go out and not be with my parents 24 seven. Even after the treatment's finished, I've still got further surgeries to repair my scar on my on my leg because the scar hasn't fully healed and we need to repair that. I have hearing loss um, and I have a hearing aid to, to help that. I have lung damage, I have liver damage, I have kidney damage. Um, I have multiple slip discs in my spine. I have hip difference because of the prosthetic. Oh, I take medications to help it. I have ones to help my kidneys, uh, my bowels, and pain medication daily, every night. I also have to have yearly scans of my heart because one of the chemos I had is known to damage the heart and I also have lung checks every six months because if I'm gonna get a reoccurrence it's more likely to come back in the lung. I, I decided to get involved with the Friends of Rosie charity because I want people to go through chemo without having long lasting side effects and not have it as harsh as it currently is. I think the research will really help for everybody who has to go through the chemo process and I, I think it's just amazing what the Friends of Rosie charity does. Therapy. Osteosarcoma is currently treated with quite um, outdated chemotherapy, gruelling drugs um, and often associated limb amputations. Um, so as well as that, uh, osteosarcoma can also spread to other parts of the body, particularly the lungs. I'm doing now was kickstarted um, by funding from Friends of Rosie. We would not be able to have done any of this uh, without that funding. So I'm Katie Finnegan. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. I have a little bit of a cold, as you can probably tell, which is altering my voice, um, but not my science. OK, so I'm going to see whether I can move these slides ahead. It's a slight back time, so hopefully that will have moved. Otherwise, I can just assume control and share the screen, Helen, if it doesn't work as well as we'd hoped. That might be better on the basis that I've pressed it a couple of times and I don't think it's going to jump forward. Is that OK? Okay, hang on, we jumped, we jumped, okay. So um, osteosarcoma, obviously, as Ruth was saying there, is um, uh, a cancer that occurs in the bone. Uh, and that uh, some of the cells inside that bone start to grow out of control. And one of the key problems that you can have is that um, those tumours can spread to other parts of the body. Um, and again, as Ruth was saying, that's why she has to have her checks every six months. One of the key places that that can happen is in the lung. So my research was around trying that we can do to stop that. Okay, so currently um, the treatment options for someone with osteosarcoma are surgery or chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is horrendous. Um, as you've probably got a, a small capture of that from, from Ruth and all the medications that she has to take just to mitigate for the side effects from the life-saving chemotherapy. It does leave patients with long-lasting effects. So that chemotherapy regime might have been tweaked slightly but it's not really changed for the last 40 years. So what can we do about that? So the solution really is, is 
targeted treatments and those targeted in the specifics of the osteosarcoma uh, rather than chemotherapy which aims itself at cells that divide a lot and, and lots of our cells in our body divide a lot and ones that we actually need and that's why people get so sick so we're looking for a sort of achilles heel a real thing that's driving the osteosarcoma on its own and we'll target that instead um, and that shouldn't affect the rest of the body so much and therefore it's going to be a, what we would classify as a kinder treatment okay so this is just a, a diagram to show what we were looking at and how we did it. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of science because everybody should count on science every now and again. But the blob at the top here is um, the tumour, the osteosarcoma. And what can happen um, is when it spreads to another part of the body, um, what's happening there is some of the cells from that tumour are getting into the bloodstream um, and they, they float around in the blood. Sometimes they do nothing. Sometimes they die. Unfortunately, sometimes they can come back out of a blood vessel and go and start colonising somewhere else like the lung. So what we did is we took the, um, the blood. Um, from, well, I didn't do this personally. I worked at this, um, with, a, with another scientist down in um, East Anglia. We take the blood from patients, very kindly donated by lots of osteosarcoma patients, and we spin them around in, in fancy tubes, essentially, and we get those cells out of the blood to have a look at what they're doing. And from that, we get this crazy looking map, which is intimidating even for the scientists who are looking at it. And it tells you what's going on inside those cells that's making them come out of that tumour that started in the bone and going into the lung. So what is going on there? What's causing that? What's the driver? What's, what's happening there? And if we can work out what that is, could we drug it? Could we stop it? So that's what we were trying to look at. And we found two key things that were doing that. You don't have to necessarily worry about the next that were there in almost all cases, they were the things that were consistently driving that process. So then you use that information to try and develop um, a therapy targeted. Proteins, which they are very peculiarly, um, there is some logic and um, it doesn't seem like that uh, necessarily if you're not in the biology. So my project from Friends of Rosie was to work on this protein at five. So what it normally does in cells, it has a job in cells normally, and it converts messages that the cells get from outside. Um, and that's normally very tightly regulated. It gets switched on and it gets switched off. Um, in cancer, including osteosarcoma, this particular protein goes out of control. So it gets mutated and changed. And that's why cancer cells are different. They have changes inside them that are different to the rest of the body. Um, and what happens is the ERK5 gets extremely shouty and starts making those signals happen all the time. So instead of listening to its boss, it becomes rogue and starts saying to cells to divide all the time. And it also tells the immune cells in our body to join in on its uh, bad behaviour and support what's going on. So it, it, that's what happens during cancer and in osteosarcoma as well. So that's how the cancer can be driven and how it can be um, spread in terms of metastasis. Okay, so I'm not going to go through these images particularly, but I really just wanted to show you guys some actual science that was done. So these are sections of tumours. And essentially, if something's uh, blacker, there's more of it. So what we did is we blocked ERK5 in models of osteosarcoma and we saw what happens then. So if this is going to be a good target, why don't we mimic that? Why don't we pretend to make a drug that acts like um, getting rid of the ERK5 and see if we actually achieve anything? So what we did is we, we used animal models um, and we removed ERK5. And what we got was... Um, this other target that I talked about a few slides ago, that stopped working. So that was great. The other thing that was driving the spread to the lungs. And most importantly, when we looked inside the lungs, these blue blobs that you can see on the left hand side, that's tumours growing into the lungs from it having spread. And we didn't get any spreading when we removed the ERK5 from the tumour. So obviously we stopped the spread, which was very good. We're very happy about that. Um, but the issue is although very positive, you can't um, do this method 
in people, we needed to make sure that we could uh, develop a drug. So that's what the Friends of Rosie funding helped um, support a big application. And now we've got a drug discovery um, programme where we've made drugs against this pathway. Um, sorry, I need to make it move on to the next one. So we've now been able to make drugs against this ERC5 pathway. So the other pathway that I mentioned that was really also involved in the spread to the lung CMMP9, there are drugs available, but they don't work. They've tried them already. Um, so we, there are also some drugs available on the market that act on the switch that turn this um, protein off and they don't work either. This is all a bit doom and gloom. I promise you it's going to get better than this. Um, and then now we've made some drugs um, that actually get rid of the protein entirely. Over there. Um, and that works really, really well in our test that we've got so far. And bonus material, when we get rid of it, it also seems to get rid of this other target that was important as well. So it turns out that. Um, those two proteins were related to each other and were able to wipe out those two key things that we saw driving that spread to the lung with one drug. Um, so I'm calling it a drug, but we think about it from a future perspective, we need to develop that. Um, so it's available for, for patients to use. So it would be a, a kinder treatment in the sense that it's more targeted. Um, at the moment, we're testing it alongside chemotherapy in, again, in um, non-human models, in mouse models. And we've got a, another project that, again, we got because of the Friends of Rosie funding. Who's, and we've got a student who um, is doing that for three years for a PhD. Um, we've got another project from Bone Cancer Research Trust to test uh, this whole principle in other bone cancers. Um, and all of this together is going to get a package of data to support that clinical trial of the drugs um, for future use for osteosarcoma patients. And none of that would have been possible if it hadn't been for that kickstart funding from Friends of Rosie. So it's just one type of childhood bone cancer. Um, and another is Ewing sarcoma. So Mahesh Farah knows all about this type of childhood cancer. Um, he had it as a child and then unfortunately suffered it again as a young adult. I think we're going to see a video about his story. I was dying. I diagnosed uh, with cancer in uh, 1998 uh, when I was eight years old. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, on my left left thigh. I had 12 months of chemotherapy effectively, which was very, very harsh type of chemotherapy. Um, and I had two surgeries on my on my left, uh, left thigh uh, to the extent to which, you know, effectively most of my muscle on my left thigh had been removed to try and ensure that all the cancer had, had been taken out. You know, when I was 20, 21, I got diagnosed again in 2012. Um, that was by accident, quite literally by accident. Um, I uh, injured myself at the gym and hurt my collarbone and a massive lump appeared on my collarbone almost instantaneously. Um, and I got put through the system again and referrals and another biopsy was had and it was it was malignant again. Um, I think what was say what was most frustrating to me and one of the reasons what's, what's led me here today um, and, and to speak to you is really my own frustration and, and, and really disappointment and anger at some of the at the lack of advances, I guess I, I put it that way in, in, in for my opinion anyway. In, in the treatment of um, children's cancer. It remains an incredibly sad fact that it is usually left to the families of the child that has suffered or suffered, suffered or suffering from cancer to raise awareness and raise money into the research that led to that cancer and in some instances led to the, the tragic death of, of that child. You know, it just pains me to think of there being so many young people who have died of this illness, of this disease. And indeed, even those children who, like myself, we've been very lucky to survive, um, but are now left with, you know, life-changing side effects. And perhaps some of those side effects could be avoided um, with better research. And, you know, children won't be left with 
you know, children who've survived won't be left with, you know, robbed childhoods in some instances or horrible mental scars or, you know, limitations on what they can do in their lives going forward. Um, and that for me is really what all this is about. Good evening, everybody. It's, this is Caroline Dive, and it's uh, an honour and a privilege to be with you tonight, celebrating 30 years of Friends of Rosie doing their incredible work in fundraising for research into children's cancer. Research, as Mahesh knows and has told us, is vital to reduce the time between the start of symptoms and the diagnosis of a Ewing sarcoma. And, and what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just tell you about a really exciting new project that I'm delighted to be part of, uh, with funding from Friends of Rosie. And I want to tell you about how we're going to develop what I call a liquid biopsy to optimize the management of UX sarcoma, to be able to pick it up early, to be able to monitor how quickly treatment is working or not working, and to pick up when tumors start to relapse, to pick that up early too, so it can be treated earlier. So the work I'm gonna to talk to you about is uh, a collaboration between myself out at the Cancer Research K Manchester Institute uh, with Dr. Dominic Rothwell, who works in my laboratory, and Dr. Martin McCabe from the Christie Hospital. So I hope that the twinning of researchers and clinicians will at least begin to do what Mahesh wants, which is do research. We'll make this disease, this really dreadful disease, easier uh, uh, to manage uh, with hopefully better treatment and outcomes in the future. So let me see if I can move the slides onwards. It takes a little while, there we go. So just as a bit of an introduction to this, this disease then, uh, back in 1921, an American pathologist, Dr. James Ewing, described the first cases of this rather unusual bone cancer in children. And it was quite distinctive, composed of small round blue cells. Now this disease was uniformly fatal within two years of diagnosis back then. In the 1970s, clinical trials showed that long-term survival was possible if surgery was combined with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And that was a big step forward, but sadly, as Mahesh has pointed out, through the 80s, 90s and 2000s, even though there were multiple trials of different chemotherapy and radiotherapy regimes, there's been little or no improvement on survival. So quite clearly, more research is needed. So Ewing's, oops, let's go back one, that changed too quickly. Okay, Ewing's occurs in, in about 100 people each year in England. It peaks during adolescence and early adulthood. It's the second most common bone cancer of children and young adults, and sadly still amongst the worst survival of all cancers in this age group. And, and the area that I want to tackle is, is really summarized here. This relies on scans and tumor biopsies to make a diagnosis and then multiple scans and X-rays during and after the treatment to see whether the treatment's working and to detect a relapse of that tumor. So let me jump ahead. The real reasons why we have poor survival and lack of progress is that early symptoms are not very specific. And so tumors, when they are diagnosed, they're quite large. And sometimes you can't even have surgery because one in four of those patients will already have metastatic disease that as um, we've just heard about can spread throughout the body. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to diagnose folks earlier with smaller tumors before they've spread. We need to identify quickly whether the treatment they're having is working rather than spending months giving them chemotherapy with those side effects you've heard about, which is not very effective. We need to monitor the disease to make sure we can pick it up early if it's coming back so we can treat it sooner. So all of these to-dos would be possible if we could develop a reliable diagnostic blood test. So a, what I call those is a liquid biopsy. Okay, so normally in cancer research, the gold standard for looking at a, at a mass of cells in the body that shouldn't be there is a tumor biopsy. Uh, that's invasive. It's a medical procedure that sometimes needs, uh, sometimes needs anesthetic. It can be difficult. It's very expensive. And even if you do it, sometimes you only get a small amount of tumor to look at. Um, and if the patient already has multiple tumors, which, which tumor do you look at to try and make a diagnosis and understand its biology? And, and taking biopsies from children in particular over and over again is unusual and definitely not desirable. So if we could take blood samples, and you've heard a little bit about this from Katie, and she was looking for those circulating tumor cells, but if we could take a blood sample, it's, it's not so invasive, it's not so expensive, it can be done over and over again, 
and folks are used to giving blood and children in hospitals give blood samples all the time. So this would enable us to monitor a tumor over and over. Um, it would allow us to identify relapse and it would actually also allow us to study that relapse of that tumor and understand why the tumor has resisted its therapy. So without wanting to sound too arrogant, it turns out that the lab I've been developing now for 30 years, uh, we're now experts in developing and evaluating blood tests, but we've been doing this in adult cancers. And as you've heard throughout this evening, uh, it's time for us now to turn our attention and work hard uh, to help research for children's cancers. So let me tell you a little bit more about liquid biopsies and, and the ones that we're particularly interested in. So, so Katie was looking at cells in the blood that have come from the tumor. I'm looking at fragments of DNA and RNA, so the genetic material. And when cells die, all cells at some point when they die, they release their genetic material into the blood. Now there's more of this genetic material in cancer patients and this tumor derived circulating genetic material is unique to the cancer cell. Now the challenges are, there's a very small amount of it. We're not quite sure how stable it is. It's quite degraded. And there's always a background of normal cell genetic material in the blood. So we have to pick out the tumor, the tumor material. The advantages, as I mentioned, is its blood is easy to get. We can collect it over and over. We can get a real time look at that tumor and how it's changing over time. So let me tell you about what we're going to do with Friends of Rosie funding. It turns out in, the 20, in 2010, inter international teams found that this genetic material could be found in the blood of patients with Ewing sarcoma at diagnosis. And they also showed that the ch there was changes and the amount of that genetic material changed and dropped when chemotherapy started. And it came back up again in the blood when the disease relapsed. Now there's something really specific about Ewing sarcoma, a very distinguishing molecular feature and it's called the EWSR1 FLI1 gene fusion. And instead of having genes which sit in their normal place in the nucleus of cells in this disease, they've changed places and there are two genes next to each other wouldn't normally be next to each other. And they give rise to this thing called a gene fusion. And actually what this is, is a molecular signpost that a patient has Ewing sarcoma. So can we find this very specific molecular signpost in a blood sample? So our Friends of Rosie study, we've just started it just in July, uh, will exploit this unique fusion of genes present in all Ewing sarcoma patients to develop this diagnostic blood test. We're gonna compare two, two flavors, if you will, of the blood test to see which are better. We're going to compare two different technologies. And it's really great that we've got some extra funding from Thermo Fisher, one of the technologies that we're looking at, and Illumina, the other technology that we're looking at. So we're gonna see when we develop this blood test for Ewing sarcoma, which technology is going to be the best. And very importantly, we're gonna think about how we take the blood and how we store it to see which type of blood tube, for example, will perform the, the best. And this is really important when you're developing a blood test that you need to use in the clinic. So if we do this and we do it well, and it's, it's robust and reliable, and we can use it in the clinic, doctors like Dr. Martin McKay, my collaborator, will be able to diagnose people earlier with smaller tumors before they spread. We will be able to identify whether treatment is working sooner rather than later, potentially sparing months of giving ineffective chemotherapy with those side effects that we absolutely want to avoid. And we'll be able to monitor disease relapse to pick it up earlier for those earlier interventions. And we have a friend of Rosie funded technician called Alan Redford, Redfern. He started to work in my lab uh, just in the middle of July. And the Friends of Rosie funding has already generated some new funding because he'll be joined uh, uh, by a Christie Hospital funded PhD student called Sophie, who's trained in my lab. She's super good. And she's gonna join with Alan to make this project go faster. Uh, she'll start at the end of September. So I'm looking forward to sharing results of their data uh, with the Friends of Rosie SAB. They'll have to make sure we're on track and we're making progress, as, as John had said. But I think it's just tremendous that we, we I agree with, with what's gone before. There needs to be more funding for children's cancer. I'm the director of a Cancer Research UK Institute in Manchester. And all that infrastructure that CR UK has funded is now going to help me uh, work hard for the Friends of Rosie on this paediatrics cancer project. But I think it's also true that folks like the folks who've run Friends of Rosie for the last 30 years have given the bigger charities and government 
a bit of a poke and said, come on guys, we need to spend more money on children's cancers. And it is happening, uh, perhaps not as fast as we would like, but we certainly now have all got our ears pricked up and we are going to work very hard to make a difference for children with cancer. Caroline, that's, don't go away. We're, 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 sharing this, um, we're sharing this camera um, because uh, we're very worried about the broadband falling, out, falling apart if we put too many machines on it. That was fantastic. Thank you to you. Thank you very much to John and thank you to Katie for, for sharing what you do, um, uh, not just for Friends of Rosie, but for, um, for major cancer research in trying to find preventions and cures and treatments, above all treatments at the moment, uh, for children with, um, with cancer. Now, uh, we have some time left, if you would like to. Uh, if you would like to ask uh, questions, then please write it on the chat uh, and we'll keep talking and to give you time to type a few questions in. But uh, I think uh, John and Katie are also still on the line. So say you can see that you've got I've got uh, Caroline here next to me, uh, so we can put some quick some of your questions to them if you have any. Caroline, while people are thinking about this, we all thought once the COVID epidemic hit that there would never be a vaccination against COVID, and yet all of a sudden there were loads of them. Is is that simply because they threw money at it? That's a, that's a rather tough question. The answer is is yes. Um, you know, I think the pandemic has taught us a lot. And I think the other thing to say is, you know, British scientists have been leading the way in developing vaccines over the years. So one of the ways that AstraZeneca and Oxford could move quickly is that they had already been thinking about making these types of vaccines. But, but, so, but having more money to put in course, is, is, is essential. Well, research without money is a non-starter. And then you can see where I'm going. So when it comes back to, to childhood cancers, uh, is the reason, I mean, we always say as a charity that the, the reason is that there isn't enough money going into childhood cancer. Is that your frontline experience? So, yes, because I'm also the director of a lung cancer center of excellence, you know, and this is one of the big common cancers that kills a lot of people. And, you know, many years ago, this was identified as a priority and more funding came into lung cancer research. And we've seen what that's done. Now, lung cancer still kills a lot of people, but we do have targeted therapies that at least increase lifespan so you know there have been there have been steps forward that's another tumor type that we still need to do a lot more work on but i think it illustrates that when you prioritize an area and you fund it better the research gets you progress so you know i think i think always the answer to do we need more money for research the, always, the answer is always yes but alongside of that you have to really think very carefully about how you're going to spend it and actually be a efficient with the money that you do have. So don't do wasteful, silly experiments, think them through, have a good experimental plan and execute with care. So I, I think, you know, all of those things are important. And that, of course, is why we have the SOB, the Scientific Advisory Board, and uh, delighted to have John, uh, Professor John Hickman with us. Um, uh, John, there's a, a question coming in here. Let me just have a look. Um, I heard yesterday, um, says the question, that there are currently new trials in the northwest. I've lost it. Was it gone? Um, for leukemia, I think. Wasn't for it? leukemia. Here we are. Is this correct? I don't know whether any of you can answer this. Well, I can give it a go. So one of, one of the, um, the faculty that I, I direct at the Institute has taken his research right way through for leukemia, acute, uh, acute myeloid leukemia in this case, He's taken that right the way through to phase one trials at the Christie. So yes, there are certainly in the Northwest, a lot of talented clinicians, were, and this is a clinical academic that did this work. So he does lab work and runs clinical trials. Okay. So definitely they're, they're happening in the Northwest. They're happening in the Northwest. Of course, we're not just, a, uh, we are a Northwest chari based charity, but we don't just fund uh, projects here in the Northwest. We are open to funding projects anywhere. And um, uh, John, can you just fill us in on how, hard it is to find the really good projects or how easy <laughs> um yes it, it is quite hard um i think it goes back to the fact that there isn't sufficient momentum in pediatric oncology um and i'm i'm delighted and i hope i'm not patronizing you here caroline um but i'm delighted that um you and your team that were so dedicated to looking at lung cancer are using now the tech the same technologies uh, to look at pediatric cancer. 
So I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, I, I just think that the scientists and clinicians, not the pediatricians, of course, but uh, the oncologists in general, um, have indeed ignored childhood cancer and concentrate on, on the big C's, colon cancer, uh, lung cancer and breast cancer, uh, quite rightly. But I think that, as Caroline and others have said, uh, this is changing. And uh, I know that within Europe, um, pediatric cancer is now a priority. And I know, although, um, you know, I, I'm a European, um, that uh, in the UK, I know that Cancer Research UK has woken up and, and now has um, an important uh, programme there. Not many projects being funded, but again, people who probably were involved with adult cancers, turning their eyes to, to pediatrics. So I think things are on the move. What's important is the nursery. Um, it's really important that new ideas, um, you know, they're very um, gentle sort of stages of, of uh, getting moving forward are funded in the way that Friends of Rosie does. And talking to Cancer Research UK, they don't do this. Uh, and I have a long conversation with them about Friends of Rosie, and they're delighted that there is a fund that does pump priming. Yeah, I can, I can concur. And I think, you know, we do have in Guy Makin, the lead of the Experimental Cancer Medicines Network for Pediatrics, that's led from Manchester. And that network is linked increasingly with the adult Experimental Cancer Medicines Network that I, mm. I am the non-clinical lead for in Manchester. Um, so, and I guess the other thing to say, one of the challenges for many of the pediatric cancers is they are, they are quite rare. And that means that you really need international collaboration for trials to get enough uh, participants and, you know, getting enough tumor tissue and, and blood samples, again, for rare diseases is much more challenging than, for example, for lung cancer. So, you know, there are special challenges, I think, uh, for, for pediatric cancer research, but I actually think I'm very positive because I think Friends of Rosie have done an amazing job and, you know, Cancer Research UK have, woke, have woken up, as you said, and they are prioritising paediatric cancers as well. So I think, I think the, big one, the big fish, the little fish, the whales, the government, you know, there's lots of folks who should be looking at paediatric cancers again, putting much more emphasis and much more funding there. But I think, you know, we're here to celebrate 30 years of Friends of Rodeo and what an incredible job they've done for 30 years. It, it, it seems, John, that 30 years has gone by pretty quickly, but uh, to stick at it and to keep the persistence and the resilience and the spotlight on children's cancer is just a remarkable achievement. And on that note, Caroline, thank you so much. Thank you for telling us about the research that you're doing um, uh, as part of the uh, Friends of Rosie latest projects. Uh, thank you also for, for um, uh, filling us in on some of the wider uh, activities that are going on. Thank you very much too to John Hickman and to Katie Finnegan. Um, we are really privileged to have incredible researchers uh, who are not just scientists, but in many cases, practicing pedi uh, uh, pediatricians and uh, oncologists as well, working with us. And of course, a huge thank you to Ruth Grace, to Daniel and to Mahesh to, for sharing their stories uh, with us. And not just sharing their stories, but actually actually becoming Friends of Rosie ambassadors. But of course, most of all, Lisa and uh, Patrick uh, Larkin and I and the rest of the Friends of Rosie trustees would very much like to thank all of you because without all of you raising the money that you do, none of this would happen. We, we need your continued support, as you've heard. Uh, we need more money, I'm afraid. We always need more money. And uh, the researchers can put it to very good use. I know that uh, you will have understood that from what you've heard this evening. So please, if you can, continue to support us. Regular donations by direct debit really are 
tremendously helpful to us. We recently set up a, a, a proper direct debit, debit scheme to make it easy for you to, to donate in that way. If you'd consider it, it really would be hugely helpful because that enables us to plan with much more certainty. It enables us therefore to say to researchers like Caroline and her team and, uh, and Katie, uh, yes, we can uh, not only uh, support you and this particular project for the next year, but probably for a second year as well. And that gives them twice the chance to begin to make the strides that we need to attract further funding and eventually to find those preventions, those, those treatments and those ultimately those cures as well. So if you feel that you can do that, that would be uh, tremendously helpful. Please look for further details on how you can support us um, on our website. And I hope you will uh, consider joining our regular guardian giving scheme, which is what we've called it. You really do have the power to make the difference. Um, and thank you so much for all you've done in the past, for all you're doing at present, and for what I hope you might also do in the future. Thank you all.